Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Milking the Word, where we're following the edict given in 1 Peter 2.2 and desiring the sincere milk of the word uh, through a verse-by-verse study. And today we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And so before jumping into it, as always, I do want to pray. Uh, so if you guys want to pray with me, I'd appreciate it. Lord, I um, feel like I'm just kind of jumping into this with very little preparation, which seems foolish when uh, we attempt to handle your word. It is the most magnificent, precious, valuable important uh, thing on, on the planet is the most important thing we can have is your word your living word that speaks to us that guides us and we have to properly interpret it Lord your your word says that scriptures aren't open to private interpretation we're supposed to read it as you intended Lord as you um, interpret it not us it is, it's your word. We have to know what you mean, not what we want it to mean. And we're told to study, um, to show ourselves worthy. Um, and we're, we're to give ourselves to a diligent, careful handling and study of your word, Lord, so that we um, res resist the temptation to to see it in in a way that um, we want to see it we have biases in our hearts our hearts are deceitful we trick ourselves into thinking things um, we can twist your scriptures and it says that we twist them to our own destruction when when we try to make them say what we want them to say Lord and so it's it's so important to come to your word with reverence and to, to fight against the temptation to have preconceived ideas, to have biases, Lord. We, we want to come as blank slates and just let your Holy Spirit speak to us and, and teach us what you mean, what you would have us to learn, Lord. And praise God, you're a, you're a clear communicator. I thank you so much that um, you don't speak in riddles or mystery. Um, you make your, your word plain. It's our hearts that trick us, Lord. It's our hearts that twist things and turn us away from the pure meaning of your word. If we would just take it at face value and just accept what you have to say, Lord. And so I pray for that. Humble us, Lord. Humble us beneath your word. Help us to trust in your word. And I, I ask that you give us insights here today. That um, you open up the meaning of this verse, that you explain it to us, that, that we see clearly what it is you're communicating. Keep us free from error and mistakes, Lord. And anybody watching this, Lord, just protect them. Don't, don't let them just trust me. I mean, who, who am I? Just a guy on the screen, you know, it's... There's no reason for them to trust me to tell them anything about the scriptures, Lord. I pray that you would compel and move people to go to the scriptures and to study these things out for themselves. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so as always, the first thing we're going to do is just read it through and see if anything sticks out to us. And then we'll backtrack and kind of um, uh, unpack it piecemeal, uh, word by word. So we have, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? So kind of the key words there, um, who, that's, that's making me think, okay, I have to know who, who is referring to. I'm going to need context here. Um, sealed, that, that's a, a word that, that sticks out there. 
um, given, earnest. That's not a word that we use every day, so I'm, I'm, we're going to have to look that one up. What, what exactly is meant by that word? Um, spirit and hearts. Those, those are our key words here. And so, yeah, looking at this, like, it just off that, uh, what do they call it? Is it a cursory view? Is that what that's called, where you just take a quick glance? Um, it's, kind, it's, it's a verse that I can't just take right out the gate. It's going to require context. It's going to require investigation for, to me, for me to make heads or tails. This isn't one of those verses that just stands alone. It's, it's in the midst of something. It, 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 it requires the context to understand what's being said here. Um, so I went back prior to starting this video just to look at the chapter and see where we really get our context. And really, we, we can just go back one verse and we get the who. So we're looking for who. Well, who is who referring to? And it says here, Now he which establish... Uh, this is verse 21. Now he which establish us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God who so God is the one being referred to and um, it's also clear here uh, because if you're coming into the scriptures with the with the proper Trinitarian understanding like <clears throat> I think most people raised in American culture have some sort of concept of the Trinity um, just because we're brought up in that like Protestantism Roman Catholicism uh, both agree on the Trinity and that probably makes up the vast majority of Christendom within America and so most of us at least have a rudimentary concept of what the Trinity is and we understand that and and some people it, it gets tricky if you try to um, understand it too much because it, it's really a, a foreign concept to us but it, it can be accepted by faith if you understand there's one God. If we take God to mean supreme being, supreme entity, um, creator and maker of all things, there is one God who has chosen to reveal himself um, as three. He's chosen from the beginning, in the beginning of time, when we read in Genesis, it says that um, uh, God said, let us make man in our image us and our are plural words so so god is communicating to himself there but we also learn in the scriptures that god is one there's only one god so it's not this creator being talking to other creator beings it's not this it's not the <clears throat> um immortal all-powerful all-knowing god speaking to another god because the scriptures again clearly teach us there's only one god there's just one there is one maker and and that makes sense logically because if you take things back to to if you think okay how was this made ultimately you're going to come to one source everything can trace back to one there has to be one above all there has to be a beginning and and that is the one true god but he says let us make man in our image and then it talks about how the it also says that the spirit of god was moving above the waters so we get an essence though not really defined we get an essence of plural plurality within the godhead and then in the new testament it's unpacked we we learn clearly then it's revealed that there's uh in first john 5 it says for there are three that bear witness in heaven the father the word and the holy spirit so we see there, okay, there's three. This Godhead, this being, has chosen to exist as three separate beings, all equally God, fully God. And so, like, that's where you go, how can something be three and one? How can something be fully and yet separate? How, how can Jesus be fully God and yet distinct from the Holy Spirit? And, and But as you read through the scriptures, if you accept that by faith, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. Um, when you try to make human mathematical logic of it is when confusion comes in. But I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting way off base here. But I wanted to touch that because this context here talks about when you read back towards the beginning here, um, grace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So the word and, which is in almost all the, the letters, um, shows a distinction between the two. 
Um, blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, God of all comfort. Um, we are comforted of God. Um, so the, just the context here of the chapter um, shows that this is referring to the Father. Um, within that within that triune body, um, there's Father, Word, which is is how Jesus was referred to before he became Jesus. You know, there, there's always been the three within the Godhead. There was Father, um, who is the invisible, um, I I immortal light. Uh, is I, he, that's a bad. It's real hard to. You almost got to be real careful about how you talk about that so you don't fall into blasphemy but um the scriptures tell us that he's invisible and no man hath ever seen him um no man can see him so so he he the entity of the father is an invisible entity but he is always for eternity without beginning without end he has always chosen to reveal himself and that revelation came through word let us he spoke into existence that so that's a revelation if something is invisible and all of a sudden a voice comes forth it's a revelation and that revelation is called the word and in john 1 we learned that it is the word the revelation of god that became flesh became jesus so in the beginning we had father word and holy spirit the spirit moved above the waters so um this here is talking about the father um he is the who and we see that because it, just in that in that 21 there, in Christ and hath anointed us is God. So there's a distinction made between Christ and God right here. So obviously when it says God, it's referring to the Father. So it is the Father who hath sealed us. I'm sorry, that was really long-winded. I didn't intend to get into Trinity there. Um, but who is the Father of the Godhead? It is the Godhead. The Father hath... And, and so hath is a uh, past tense word. It hath is, is um, something that ha hath already been done. Um, so that this is, this is um, uh, completed. This is fulfilled. God hath, God has already also. So again, the also is the context um, in the, what just happened here? I lost my my page, I think. Or is it just, uh, where did it go? Sorry about that. Read the full chapter. <clears throat> so in 21 there, he established us and anointed us and also, so that's what it's referring to. Um, God, he, which has established us and anointed us, has also. So God the Father hath already, has already done, has also, in addition to these other things, sealed us. So what is meant by sealed? We're, we're going to need a definition of that word. Because um, it, it's unique to, to say somebody can seal an individual. Like how do you seal an individual? You seal a letter, you seal um, uh, a bag. But how do, you, how do you seal an individual? Um, what is meant by that word here? So we go to our concordance. To set a seal upon, mark with a seal. Um, so that makes you think like when the kings would use their ring in wax to put a mark upon it to say this belongs to the king. And so like to mark with a seal, it's, it's uh, um, ownership. And then this is interesting here, for security from Satan. It, it's protected from what the, God hath, whatever the ceiling is, it marks the person. It marks and protects them from Satan. Um, to mark a person or a thing, to impress of a seal, again, like a signet. Um, angels are said to be sealed by God in order to prove, confirm, or attest a thing. Uh, to prove, to... to um, uh, confirm it's it's like when you go to a notary and a notary stamps it they watched you they're stamping their seal on it to say this is confirmed this has been witnessed um so so it's interesting it's an interesting word so god god the father hath already 
in addition to these other things, has confirmed, protected, marked, and set apart us. So who's the us? Does it, and that, that's what I was kind of looking into before I started this video. Is it us, Christians? Is it all the born again? Or is it just uh, from the context here? Oh man, I keep doing that. I keep going back instead of clicking this. Sorry about that. From the context here, if we go back a couple other verses, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, was preached among you. We're back in 19 here. Uh, even by me, that's Paul, and Silvanus and Timotheus, uh, was not yea, yea, but in him was yea, for all the promises um, under the glory of God by us. So the us there is referring to Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus. Now he which established us, again, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, hath anointed us, who hath also sealed us. So the us in the context is referring to Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus. So, but then you go, because this is a verse that brings a lot of comfort when understood. If I'm, if I'm sealed, like Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus are sealed, that means they're protected, they're confirmed, they're um, uh, permanently marked as gods. These belong to God. They've been set apart, sealed, delivered. Like a sealing, if it's a signet, like you didn't crack that. If a king were to, to put his mark on that wax and send a letter, that, that's how it was protected because if that seal was cracked, um, there's like death involved in that. That's it's, it's something that is not done. And so if God seals you, like you are protected permanently. Satan can't get at that. Um, you are confirmed. You are set apart for him. And so there's a lot of comfort in that if it applies to me. But does it, does it or does it only apply to Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus? And so um, I thought, well, there's other scriptures and so if i'm just looking at this one verse with no understanding of the rest of the scriptures if i'm new to the scriptures and i'm just working through corinthians for the first time hopefully i've read some other stuff but there are other places where we read that this would mean us as well so i looked up uh where do, where does it talk about sealing in the bible and um we got john 3 which really doesn't uh show us anything um, John 4, um, Acts, it says, uh, And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving... Uh-oh, sorry about that. I don't know what just happened. Uh, screen blacked out there for some reason. I don't know if it's because of the ads on this particular page. Um, so God, in Acts 15, God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, so here, it's more than just the us of the writers. It's more than Paul or Luke or whoever was writing Acts or whatever was going on in the context here. It was also given to them. And I think this is talking about where um, the Spirit was given to the Gentiles, not just the Jews. Uh, but again, is it is it personalized for me? Um, Acts 11, I don't know, Acts 5. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. So again, the, the, the context there seems to imply all of Christendom. And then this is the one I really, this this seals it for us, seal. Uh, Galatians 3, 5. He therefore that ministereth to you, and that's Paul writing to the church at Galatia, which is applicable to all churches. Uh, Galatia wasn't just special. It's, it, it's a letter written for all Christians. So he therefore that ministereth to you, that's all of us Christians, the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. So he, he ministereth to us the Spirit. He gives to us the Spirit. Um, and then we got our verse here. Uh, no, he brought us the self same thing. Okay. So that Galatians verse, uh, just to me, shows us that this ceiling is not just um, unique to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. It, it's it's a sealing that occurs to all Christians. Anybody who gets the Spirit of God, and we're born above in in the the Scriptures by the Spirit. We're baptized. That's how you're born again. Is the Spirit comes into you and seals you. Um, you are you are permanently made God. So this verse 
would be applicable to all of us. So God the Father <clears throat> has already, this has already been done, sealed, confirmed, marked, protected us. All of Christian done. Timothy, Paul, Silvanus, um, in, in, in specific here, and in general, everybody with the Spirit of God. So we are sealed. The, and like you, the importance of that, the, the magnitude of that idea that if you have the Spirit in you, if you've really been born again, if God has given you His Spirit, the Holy Spirit has come into your heart. He has come into you through the Word of God, through faith, and has resurrected your dead spirit, given you spiritual life, made you alive to the things of God, made you aware of the things of God. He has sealed you. you he's not only revived you and brought you to life, which is amazing, but then he has sealed you in himself. It's, it, you're in case. That's why we do baptism. A person goes down into the water, and when they come up, they have that sheen, that, that, that uh, remnant of water all over them. There's, there's, there's liquid, there's, they're sealed in water. And it's a representation of what happens to you at the new birth when you're born again. We do baptism as an example to show the world what has occurred to us internally. Internally, your dead spirit was submersed in the Holy Spirit of God and sealed with him. He is around you, your inner man. He has he is, um, encased you, uh, protected you. And there's a permanence of that. God has sealed it. Nothing can break that seal. Who is going to break the seal of God? Nothing. Nothing can undo that. So there's, there's tremendous uh, joy in that verse. God the Father um, has already, if you're born again, sealed us protected us marked us um and so we, we also get something else and given another gift he's also given the earnest so we need to know okay well well what is the the word earnest oh was i looking at the wrong oh yeah i was looking at given his spirit sorry about that um i think it's the same Ah, oh, here we go. That's frustrating. Um, the ceiling. Yeah, I apologize. I mean, I, it's the same concept um, because they both occur at the same time. So I, I messed up there. That Galatian verse uh, is talking about the giving of the Spirit. And because we're also sealed at that moment, it's applicable um, because the born again experience, there's a lot of things that occur at once. Um, you are given the gift of faith so that you can hear the word of God. And at the same time, you're given the Holy Spirit and sealed unto the day of redemption. So like all those things, it's it, I, like people try to put them in chronological order. Like how does it happen? Do you, do you receive faith first? Well, or does the spirit come first? The ceiling? But it all happens like simultaneously at the born again experience. So this verse here um, was talking about the giving of the spirit, not necessarily the ceiling. He ministereth you the spirit. The ceiling verse um, comes from Ephesians 1, uh, the, the way we can know that this applies to us. And, and praise God, this is even more confirming than Galatians. In whom ye, he's talking again to the church at Ephesians, uh, Ephesus, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So there it's, it's specifically saying Christians, after you heard the word of truth, after you heard the gospel, after you believed, you were sealed with, with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so, let's see. And again, we're also given the Spirit at the same time as well. So, we're sealed and given the earnest of the Spirit. But what does earnest mean? We need to look that word up. He has given us the earnest of the Spirit. And the word earnest is money, 
which in purchases is given as a pledge or a down payment that the full amount will be subsequently be paid. So this is like, I, I guess we would use this term in mortgages. Um, you know, you, you put a down payment on your house, you put a down payment on your car um, that shows that you have every intention of, of fulfilling the purchase. And, and that's what we are given. We are The spirit is that down payment in us. So when we are sealed and given the earnest, the down payment of a down, it's not monetary, it's the spirit. The spirit himself is the down payment that God has made on us. He comes into us, he makes this down payment, seals us, permanent, puts his mark on it, says this one is mine forever and gives us the down payment of the spirit. So we have the guarantee, the guaranteed purchase of the spirit in you. If you have the spirit in you, if you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, it is God's promise that he is going to redeem us, that he will fulfill the purchase. He's coming again to get us. Um, <clears throat> it says in another scripture, so um, God, God uh, puts that down payment on our souls and, and confirms it with his spirit in our hearts. Um, so in our inner person, right? I, I think that's the heart just means the seat of emotion, I think. Let's look at that. So it can mean the organ. And then here, this is what we're looking for. Spiritually, it denotes the center of all physical and spiritual life. So it's your it's your center, it's your inner man. It's that, that part of you that um, exists in conscience, that, that like you you sense yourself. Um, it's hard to put into words, but everybody knows what I'm talking about. You know your inner person, your thought life, your emotional life, um, that, that spiritual life that's where the Spirit of God dwells. So God the Father hath already sealed us in addition to those other things, um, which would be applicable to Paul, Timothy, and Sylvanus in this case. But again, the sealing applies to us as well. This isn't something unique to them. They weren't special super Christians. Um, they were chosen for a specific mission, uh, but they're just like every other Christian. This is the general pattern that God uses. This is how God saves. God has given us, he has sealed us, confirmed us, protected us, put his mark upon us, and gifted us, put within us, given us the guaranteed down payment, the, 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 the mark of possession saying, I own this, I'm going to come and redeem it. He has given us the earnest of the Spirit, His own Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Jesus said, I and my Father will come and dwell in you. Again, that's that Trinity. It, it happens through the Holy Spirit, but they are one. So you, so you are in the presence of God the Father and God the Son as well with the presence of the Holy Spirit in you, um, in our hearts, in our inner man, in our inner being. Um, God has sealed us and given us this guarantee. And this verse is so important, um, along with that Ephesians verse, Ephesians chapter 1, to know that you are sealed if you have been born again. And that's not something that people might intellectually think, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm, this must apply to me. You have to be honest with yourself. Um, why, why deceive yourself and end up in hell? Many come to him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these things? And they're told, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. So there are people who think they're Christians. Who's to say you're not one of those? Why would you just blindly follow along and say, ah, I'm going to make it to heaven? Examine yourself. Test yourself. See, does this spirit really dwell in me? Have I been sealed and given the guarantee of the Holy Spirit? Does he dwell within me? Do I know him? Beyond just knowing about him, do I have an intimate, personal relationship with him? Am I, am I in communication with him? Do I have that? Think about the water on your body at the baptism, how in, close and personal it is. The Holy Spirit is upon your inner man if you've been born again. And he, and he gives you ears to hear and eyes to see spiritual things. You have to have the courage to examine yourself and see if this is true. 
Um, because if it's not, you need to seek him with everything you got. He says, if you seek him, you'll find him. Um, but if you do, there's um, a joy and a comfort and a peace in knowing the, the, that I have the mark of God upon me. I am, I am immersed in his spirit. Um, I have been guaranteed by God himself with his own signet, with his own mark, that I belong to him, that I am his. I am sealed with that spirit. And the spirit in me is the evidence of that. That that spirit, the Holy Spirit dwelling in me is the evidence that I, if he's in you, you're sealed and guaranteed. And so this verse is just amazing um, for comfort. Um, but you have to examine yourself to see if this applies to you. Um, because it only applies to those who have really been born again. Um, so that's what I got for you guys. I apologize about mixing up. That. These tabs got reversed here. Um, I was wondering, as I was reading that 3.5, I was like, man, I thought that was a more solid verse on sealing. Um, but Galatians 3.5 is about giving the Spirit. And, and there's other verses probably that are better than that. Um, gave them like gift. Well, that acts, yeah. And then the sealing is uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, where it says that you believed, you were sealed. And again, that's Paul talking to the church. So although the context of our verse is is, is showing Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, uh, Timothy is, Tim, Tim, why am I saying it weird? Um, although it, it applies to them in the context, it um, Ephesians 1 makes it clear that that same sealing so the events here that are being applied to Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus um, apply to us as well, and Ephesians 1 makes that clear. Um, so, and that's why another thing too, like um, sometimes if you're not under, like if I'm reading this for the first time, I might not get that. I'm reading the context and I'm going, oh, that's for Paul and Timothy. But that's why it's important that you keep studying. And the scriptures talk about comparing scripture with scripture and line with line and, and, and so on and so forth. We, we take the ideas, um, the, 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 the um, ideologies and philosophies that are presented in scriptures. And, we, and as, as we study over time, we find other places where that same concept or same idea or same philosophy is talked about. And we're able to build a worldview um, so, so studying the scriptures is a lifelong process. Your first time through, you probably aren't going to catch everything. But your second time, and your third time, and your fourth, and fifth, and sixth, and, and 25th, and 50th time through, you're going to see connections that you had never seen before. And it is such a glorious joy when you do, because it's enlightening. It's how we learned to know God more. And the scriptures talk about that, of growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's how it's done. So, like, you might not make that connection between 2 Corinthians 1 and Ephesians 1 um, your first time through. But as you read those over and over again, you're going to recognize, oh, hey, that's talking about sealing. Where did I read about sealing again? Um, oh, Ephesians 1. Oh, hey, this isn't just talking about Paul, Timothy, and Silvanus. This is talking about all of us. And then you get this amazing joy of discovering that you are sealed. And, the, and it brings comfort and joy. And so um, studying the scriptures is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. And um, so if you're new to the faith um, or, or you've neglected this um, over time, jump back into it and start looking for those connections and, and, and let the Holy Spirit minister to you. It, it, that's another benefit of having this sealing in earnest is that the Spirit dwells within us and he's the great teacher. Ask him to reveal these things to you. So, all right, I'm rambling here. Um, I guess that's what I got for you guys tonight. As always, I truly appreciate you watching. I love you and Lord willing, we'll talk to you next time.